Good to be with you guys again this morning. My name is Dan Osborne. For those of you I haven't met, one of the pastors here at Near North, particularly over the Saturday night gathering. So it's good to be here at church on a Sunday morning. Uh, Before we get started, I want to make a quick announcement, quick plug. We are having baptisms on Easter Sunday this year, Easter weekend. Uh, And if you are a follower of Jesus and have not yet been baptized, we'd love to invite you to come out and uh, take that next step with us uh, on Easter. Baptism is really just a public declaration that you have become a follower of Jesus, that God has done an inward work in your life. So at Park, the, the way this works for us, we, we want everyone who gets baptized here to go through a baptism class. We've got a couple options coming up this week. Thursday night, we have one at 7 p.m. down in room 201, and then next Sunday morning at 8 a.m., 10.30, and 12.30, we're going to be teaching this class. And it's really a way for us to get on the same page about what baptism is, what it means, and why it's so important for us as followers of Jesus to be baptized. So you can go online to register for the class and to get and to get baptized. Uh, You know, this morning we're going to continue through our series in the book of James. What we've seen in James so far is his big concern throughout the letter that he's written is he wants to distinguish between something that he would call real religion, this authentic Christianity, what it actually means to follow Jesus, over against something that he would call like a dead religion, this empty, false kind of Christianity that what we believe cannot just stay up here. Right, it has to inform the way we live and engage in the world around us. And that's what he's been doing in his letter. We'll see him address uh, some of those same things uh, in our text this morning. So if you've got a Bible with you, why don't you open with me to James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. James 5, 7 through 11. It's on page 1013. If you have one of the house Bibles, if you have a fake Bible on your phone, you can go ahead and click it. Uh, and it'll take you right there, though I do not know the page number. James 5, 7 through 11. And, you know, as we're getting started this morning, let me just throw out a question for you to think about, keep in the back of your mind as we're talking together. Here it is. Are you a patient person? Don't, don't you, know, you know, hit your neighbor. Are you a patient person? Patience is kind of these, one of these funny things, isn't it? Because on the one hand, everybody wants to be patient or you know, knows that they at least should be patient. Right? We, we all know that we should be patient, almost intuitively. Like if you're married, you know you should be patient with your spouse. Whether or not you actually are is another question. You, know, you should be patient. If you've got kids, you, know, you should be patient with your kids, with your coworkers, with your employees. Uh, everybody wants to be patient. Patient. In fact, this idea of patience is almost so universal that if you look up any major virtue list across all major world religions, philosophies, and worldviews, all of them will identify patience in some form as something we should all be striving after. Everybody wants to be patient. If you ask anyone on the streets if they should be patient, they will tell you yes, and if they're not patient, they'll tell you they should be. Everybody wants to be patient, but here's the funny thing about it. You see, uh, nobody wants to be told to be patient. You think about that for a moment. Everybody wants to be patient. Nobody wants to be told to be patient. How many of you are in a relationship and you learn that the hard way? Thank you for raising it. Yeah, someone raised their, their spouse's hand over there. Nobody wants to be told to be patient. Nobody wants to be told that for the time being, You just need to wait. Why? It's because being told to be patient, uh, in one sense, it reminds us that we are not in control. That we're not in control, that we're going through something right now that we are almost powerless to change, that no matter how frustrating, irritating, hurtful, painful, or downright annoying, we are not in control, and for the time being, we just need to wait. Everybody wants to be patient. Nobody wants to be told to be patient. One of the reasons this is so hard is because we live in an increasingly impatient world, don't we? I mean, we live in a world where everything happens, or at least should happen, on our timetable. We want things to happen when we want them to happen. We operate in a world of unending access and immediate response, and when one option isn't fast enough, we can find in another to accommodate our needs and meet our desires. Let me give you an example 
my home, my wife and I have one of these Amazon Alexa little, you know, little things. You know what I'm talking about? It's kind of like Siri. You can ask it to add things to your to-do list, to your shopping list. Check the weather. You can have it turn on the lights if you want. It is a great 30 buck investment that we made. I love the fact that we bought it until my daughter figured out how to use it. <laughs> She's just about two years old. The other day she asked me if she could have a smoothie. I told her no, so she went to the refrigerator and told the fridge to make her a smoothie. <laughs> and she hasn't quite figured out that it's only Alexa that will do a couple things for her. So she's, I have a running list of inanimate objects she has told things to do, <laughs> do things for her. It's because when we don't meet, have our needs met, we can find something else that will meet our needs, don't we? And the irony is that many of us are absolutely gripped by the tyranny of the instantaneous and almost completely oblivious to how deeply it actually affects us. You see, it's why my daughter can absolutely lose her mind when I tell her she needs to wait for goldfish. And it's not just kids. It's not just kids. That's why we can get so frustrated, so angry when someone cuts us off when we watch our ETA go down just a couple minutes, go up just a couple minutes. That's why we can get so frustrated when someone takes too long in line to order because their Starbucks drink has about 15 different variables on it. And you know, the, the reality is though, if, if, if this frustration, if this anger, if this angst, right, is real, if that can bubble up over these little things, seemingly insignificant everyday moments in life, what happens when we are more than just inconvenienced? What happens when we are going through a real season of suffering and hardship. Some of you here this morning, that's exactly where you're at. Everybody wants to be patient. Nobody wants to be told to be patient. It's because if, if we're honest, we, we really don't know what to do with patience. What if we've misunderstood what patience is? What if we've misunderstood, what, you got this, this wrong idea of what it means to be patient, especially when we're going through some of these longer seasons of hardship and pain? In the text we're looking at this morning, James invites us to rethink patience. And what we're gonna see is that real religion understands that patience is not passive resignation but it's a hopeful anticipation of what God is and will be doing in our lives. Let me say that one more time. See, real religion understands that patience is not passive resignation, but a hopeful anticipation of what God is and will be doing in our lives. So if you're not there yet, open with me to James chapter five. We're gonna start in verse seven. Work our way through verse 11. Let me read the text and then I'll pray and we'll get started. James chapter five, verse seven. James starts this way. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you that as we come into this place this morning, you, you know every circumstance that we're bringing in right now. You know that if we haven't even told anybody else around us, you know what we've got going on in our own lives. And some of us are here and we're going through something this morning. 
And so Father, I pray as we open your word, you would remind us that it's not just my words, it's not man's words, but your word that has authority and power to bring transformation. This is the way that you genuinely speak to us today. And so I pray that you not let one of us leave here uh, untransformed by the power of your word and the power of the gospel. We ask that uh, we would be doers of the word, not just hearers of these things only. You would send us out to live lives being patient in a way that is honoring to you. We thank you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's, let's get started. Look with me at verse 7 again. James starts this way. Be patient, therefore, brothers. Let me pause for a moment. We've got to remember what James has been talking about up until this point. You know, last week, we looked at James' very direct condemnation on this idea of selfish wealth. And Jackson did a great job walking us through verses one through six last week, uh, giving us James' main point that there is coming a day when God will punish those who have used their wealth, their power, their privilege, and their resources only for themselves and to oppress others, right? But in verse seven, James kind of turns his attention, turns his focus back to address followers of Jesus, many of whom who had been oppressed, right? We're on the receiving end of what the folks in verses one through six were doing, the folks who are experiencing suffering now. And he tells them, hey, this is what your response to that suffering, this is what your response to that oppression should be. Patience. Let me ask you something. How does that sit with you? How's that sit with you that James would tell people who are going through uh, suffering right now, who are experiencing injustice, that he would tell them, be patient? You know, this is actually the second time James has told us that real religion has a particular response to uh, suffering and injustice, that it has a particular response to oppression. Let me show you what James said earlier in his letter, James chapter one, verse two, on the screen behind me. He said this, uh, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. He says, when you, when, when you meet suffering, when you meet uh, trials, when you meet hardship, James says real religion considers it joy. And over and over again in his letter, James reminds us that real religion has this particular response to oppression and suffering. And here he says, it is patience. Now the obvious question is, what does he mean by patience, right? James, James what, are you, what are you talking about with patience? Because a lot of us have the, this idea of what patience is, what it means for us, and what it means for me might look different than what it means for you. So let me give this basic definition of what patience is. Simply put, patience is waiting. But in verse seven, see what James is trying to communicate to us is that our patience has an end date. That our patience has an end date. Keep reading verse seven with me. He says this, be patient therefore brothers until the coming of the Lord. What's he talking about? You see, as Christians, we uh, believe there is a time that Jesus will return to fully establish his kingdom here on earth. And when he comes, he is going to put an end, a final end to all injustice. There will be an end to pain and suffering, sickness and death. The wicked will be punished. The righteous will be delivered. All things will be made new and all things will be made right. Ultimately, this, I mean, this is a comforting piece that James is trying to give us. He's trying to, he, he wants us to remember that there's a day coming when suffering will be no more, when pain will be no more, when the Lord uh, returns. And some of us need to be reminded this morning that as a follower of Jesus, what you are going through right now will not last forever. Right? It will not last forever. There is a day coming when your pain will be no more, your trial will end, and you will be restored. But what we got to see is that James is saying the basis of our patience, the reason we can be patient, 
is because the Lord is coming back, that we do not have a blind patience just kind of sitting back and hoping that things are going to work out. Our patience is more than just mere waiting. It is this hopeful anticipation of the promise that our God will make all things right, that patience is only possible because Jesus is coming back to establish his kingdom here. Friends, you gotta see this, that our hope is not that things might get better, but that it is the confidence we have that it certainly will come a day when justice will flow like a mighty river and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And James says, until that day, be patient. The question is how? How? What's that supposed to look like for us here and now? In the rest of the passage, James gives us three pictures of patience to show us what it is. Ultimately, he's inviting us to rethink patience because it might not be what we think it is. Three pictures of what patience is. Let me show you the first one. Look with me at the second half of verse seven. It says this, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. But the first picture he gives us, James says, hey, if you want to know what patience looks like, you need to look at the farmer. And they, we've got to be careful here because we can almost completely miss what he's talking about. We can completely miss his point here. See, James is talking about the, the process of planting and, and harvesting uh, for, for the crop, right? He's, the, the farmer starts off, he says, right after the early rains, which come down, loosen up the soil. James is uh, talking about the farmer getting in there, tilling up the ground, planting the seed, uh, planting the seed, and then he waits for the second rainy season, the late rains that give the crop this extra boost that it needs right before the harvest. But what we need to understand is that while the farmer is waiting for the harvest, and he's not just sitting back doing nothing. Right, no, 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 he is preparing for the harvest. You see, he is assuming that there will be a harvest, and so he is getting to work. He is out there day in and day out checking on his crop, making sure that he is prepared to, 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 to gather the harvest, that while he is waiting, the farmer is working. He is working while he is waiting. James wants us to understand this, that patience, no, 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 it is not passive. It doesn't mean we sit back and wait things to work themselves out, disengaging from the world around us. You know, I think, I think this is one of the problems that we have with, with being told to be patient, isn't it? Because we, we can kind of think that's what it means, to sit back and do nothing, so much so that when people tell us to be patient, and it just comes across a little tone deaf, doesn't it? Like, be, pay, get out of here with that. You don't know what's going on in my life. It just comes across a little tone deaf. And I think if we're honest, some of, many of us have used patience in that way. That when we're asking people to be patient with us, but I'm asking, I mean, if I'm honest, if I've asked my wife to be patient with me, what I'm really saying oftentimes is stop bugging me with this. Stop bothering me with this. You, you gotta let this go. Be patient with me. Be patient with us. You know, one of the sad realities of the history of Christianity in the American church is that uh, oftentimes uh, Christ churches have used the call to patience kind of to, to dismiss the works of racial reconciliation in the church, especially around this conversation of race and uh, cultures. This call to patience has really just been a, a code word uh, for stop talking about these things. Stop bringing these things up. We're happy the way that we, we are. And, and, and some of you need to be reminded this morning that to be patient is not does not simply mean to sit back and do nothing, to stop having conversations, to stop bringing things up. Friends, patience is not passive. Real religion understands that in patience we are working while we're waiting. James goes on to give us a second picture that helps us rethink patience. 
Look at me, verse 10. It says, as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who have remained steadfast. The second picture James gives us, he does something really interesting here. But, but just like the first one, it's easy to kind of miss, fly over what he, what he says. Because James talks about it, you know, so quickly. He says, if you want to know what patience looks like, you also got to look at the prophets. Remember in the Old Testament, the prophets were the ones who were speaking on behalf of God. They were the ones who, uh, in many ways, were modeling what it meant to live lives of righteousness before our God. That they were, they, they were the ones who were putting on display what it meant to, look, uh, to live a life of obedience to God. And James' point is that in many people's view, these were the folks who should have been spared from suffering. Right, these are the folks who are out there doing good things day in and day out. They're calling people, the prophets were calling people to care for the poor, the widow, the, the orphan, the most vulnerable in society. They're calling people to restore and renew the relationship back with, with God. The prophets were doing very good things. They should have been spared from suffering. And you go back and look at their stories, many of them, almost all of them were either uh, jailed by God's people, rejected by God's people, beaten or murdered for doing exactly what God told them to do. And so James says, look at the prophets. as an example of suffering and patience. Look at the prophets. Because they knew what it meant to suffer. They knew what it meant to be going through something. And at the same time, James says, but look at their patience. What's he talking about? So when you go back and read the stories like Ezekiel and Jeremiah and, and Hosea, I think what's so striking about uh, what they do is that in the face of suffering, like while they're in the midst of it, while they're going through something, and they continue to do what God has called them to do. They continue to proclaim the message about God. They continue to call people to have their relationship with him restored. In other words, in their patience, the prophets persevered. But they continue to do what God has called them to do, that, that, that their suffering was not a rain check to, to come back to the work, but it was an invitation to continue doing the work that God called them to do. You know, I think one of the best examples we see of this in, in the Bible is through the life of Paul. Remember, Paul is the one who wrote the majority, or the, about half the New Testament, all of these letters that he wrote, wrote back to churches that he had started. But you know, I think, I think one of the things we overlook sometimes is that half the letters he wrote, see, Paul wrote those when he was in prison. Maybe you gotta hear that differently this morning. Paul wrote those while he was incarcerated. While he was jailed, while he was beaten and chained up, and Paul then writes about his experience in suffering Look, let me show you what he says in the book of Philippians, the letter back to the church in Philippi that he wrote, talking about his experience. Here's what he said. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. But he says, I want you to know that what I've been going through, uh, the, the experience of suffering that I have had, what I'm going through in prison here, has actually allowed me to continue doing the work it's called me to do in ways I didn't even think about. So much so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. What he's talking about is as he's chained up under house arrest, he's talking to his uh, prison guard about Jesus. He's talking to the people around him about Jesus. He is talking about the hope, the joy, the contentment, the satisfaction that he finds in Jesus in the gospel. And yet he is doing that while he is going through something. You hear what Paul is saying? Just like the prophets, Paul did not uh, see patience in suffering as an obligation, but as an opportunity right, to continue doing what God had called him to do in ways he never expected. See, in the same way James invites us to rethink patience in suffering and begin to see it as an opportunity to be a witness to the kindness, the goodness, the satisfaction, the joy, the hope, the peace that is found in our relationship with God. You 
You stop and think about it that way, James actually hints on something that is perhaps troubling, but, but quite profound. That for some of you here this morning, do you know that the greatest opportunity you will have to share your faith will come out of the most painful experiences of your life? Some of the best opportunities you will have to be a witness to the hope and joy and peace and satisfaction that comes in the gospel will come out of the the, the most painful experiences of your life. I'll say this, that doesn't all mean you uh, pretend, just put a smile on, pretend you're cool with everything that has happened, that you uh, pretend like all is good. In fact, it might take years for you're able to share your story. Even though you're, even through your frustration, questioning about why God is doing what he's doing or why he's allowing you to experience these things when the rest of the world demands vengeance, but you ask God for patience. And that is a powerful witness to the transforming work of the gospel in your life because apart from the gospel, this kind of patience, it doesn't make any sense. And so as you are responding in patience to whatever you're going through, man, this sparks conversations with people who look at you and want to, they wonder, how could you possibly be acting this way? How could you possibly be responding in this way? Some of the greatest opportunities you will have to share with your faith will come out of some of the most painful experiences of your life. And I think the question we need to be asking ourselves is this, how might God use my story in a way that is impactful, meaningful, and perhaps even transformative in the life of someone else? How might my story be used to showcase the greater story of the gospel? As see James says, in suffering, be patient, not so that he can get you to stop talking about this stuff, not so that you uh, just brush it off and pretend like all is good, but because as a follower of Jesus, it is in your patience that you become a powerful witness for the greater hope that you have in Jesus and the gospel. And friends, the second picture James is telling us, you know, to look at the example of the prophets to see their suffering and their patience. He invites us to rethink patience and see it not as an obligation, but as an opportunity to continue to do what God has called you to do as a follower of Jesus in our patience. We are witnessing while we're working. James shows us a third picture. Look at me at verse 11. Behold, we consider those blessed who have remained steadfast. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. See, in the third picture of patience, James focuses in on the specific person from the Old Testament, the person of Job, and he talks about Job's steadfastness, his endurance, which is a way for James to to talk about patience. And if you were to go back and read Job's story, just to get uh, an overview of Job's story, what you'd see is this. The first couple chapters of the book of Job, you, 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 you get acquainted with what Job was going through, right? That he had something going on in his life, that in a matter of moments, he lost not only his health, but all of his uh, wealth, his resources, everything he had was gone. And on top of that, he suffers through the death of all 10 of his children. The next 36, 37 chapters are uh, Job's conversations with his friends and eventually with God as he begins to do exactly what every single one of us would be doing uh, going through something like that, asking that God would would, uh, help him make sense of what has happened to him, demanding that God give him an answer for why he's gone through these things. You go back and read those words and Job, he is frustrated. He is wrestling with what has happened to him. But in the final chapter of, of the book of Job, he gets everything restored. Everything he lost is restored. His health is back. He's got 10 more kids. His wealth is doubled. But you know, if, you, if you're familiar with Job's story, I think we gotta ask this question Isn't it a bit odd 
that James would use Job as a picture of patience? He spends the majority of his book complaining about what's happened to him. Isn't it a bit odd that, that James would use Job to show us what patience looks like? look what James says we see in Job's story. Verse 11. He says, we, we actually see the purpose of the Lord, his compassion and his mercy. You see, James is telling us that the most profound part of Job's story is not that at the end he has a bow that he can tie on his experience, not that he has everything restored back to him, but that while he was going through these things, uh, the most profound point is that Job experienced something with God that was utterly unique to his suffering. He experienced the deep compassion and mercy of God in a way that he could not have experienced apart from his suffering. It is the mercy and, that, and the compassion of God that compels Job to cry out in the, the, the middle of his story, though he slays me, still I will hope in him. See, for Job, his suffering is not meaningless. It's not wasted time. But in suffering, Job's patience is actually worship. And so, friends, James invites us to rethink patience in the midst of suffering so that we don't see it as wasted time. But James is reminding us that there are things we will experience with God in our suffering that we do not experience apart from our suffering, that God promises to meet us in our pain in ways that he does not promise in our comfort. And patience is not merely waiting things out, waiting for things to get better, but patience, you see, uh, is an invitation to worship, that there is a deeper affection cultivated within us for God through our suffering. And so, friends, do you see that like Job, it is our patience, our steadfastness in the face of suffering that can often be the greatest catalyst to worship that we experience See, after all, it was after the death and loss of everything that he had close to him that Job jo drove Job to speak these words, though you slay me, still I will hope in you. Friends, perhaps we need to be reminded this morning that in the same way, the greatest cause of worship that you and I have has come through suffering. But not through our own. You see, God has not called us to do something that he has not first done for us. Right? It is the story of the gospel that reminds us of the patience that God has first extended towards us. The story of the gospel that reminds us of Jesus who lived the perfect life, perfectly patient life that we should have but failed to, to live perfectly obedient to all of what God had commanded of us but that for the joy set before him, Jesus patiently endured the suffering of the cross taking our brokenness, our failure, our uh, thirst and lust for control, our impatience taking on all our sin upon himself as if it was his own dying the death you and I should have died in our place for our sin. It rose again from the dead on the third day with the promise of new life for anyone who would trust his work on the cross. Friends, the gospel reminds us uh, that Jesus was first patient in suffering for us so that we can now be empowered to be patient in whatever suffering we experience now. As a follower of Jesus, we don't have to see patience as passive resignation. But James shows us that in patience, we are working while we're waiting. We are witnessing while we're waiting. We are worshiping while we're waiting. Ultimately, as James says, the words, be patient. We don't have to hear these things as the, the cold-hearted utterance of a God who would like us to drop it and move on, but the words of a loving Father who is producing something in us through our patience that we simply cannot yet see. And so how do we grow in patience? How do we grow in patience? And I don't want to be overly simplistic. But it starts with asking God for patience. 
that he would begin to produce patience in us. James has already told us a few different ways uh, that we don't have because we don't ask. He says, you simply need to ask for patience and God will begin to produce patience. He will content, uh, begin to cultivate patience within you so that in what you're going through right now, you can have confidence that God is producing this patience in you. But I'll say this, keep in mind that praying for patience is a dangerous thing because the way he will use it, the way he will produce patience in you is taking you through these seasons of suffering, of hardship and trial. Everybody wants to be patient. Are we willing to do the work to grow in patience? It's a dangerous thing to ask God that he would begin to produce patience, but you see, it's in the midst of suffering that patience turns our experience from mere waiting and just hoping that things were, will work out. But the, the, the patience from above that we get as the Lord produces this in us turns our patience uh, into working while we're waiting, witnessing while we're waiting, and worshiping while we're waiting. The beauty is now we can begin to bring this into every arena of our lives, from the mundane, everyday encounters to the deepest, darkest valleys that we experience in this life. See, so when your husband takes a nosedive into despair, can barely get himself up out of bed in the morning, and you're left wondering how you're gonna make things work, how you're gonna keep the family going, James says, be patient. You're exhausted after another day of work and you end up stumbling back into your daughter's room for the sixth time that night to rock her back to sleep and you're wondering how you're gonna keep going. James says, be patient. The doctor comes back with a diagnosis and it is far worse than they thought and you are left wondering what now, James says, be patient patient when your timeline is long gone and the rest of your friends have gotten married and now they're starting to have kids. James says, be patient. Not because patience is going to tie a nice little bow on the end of our story so that we can uh, have everything nice and neat exactly the way that we wanted it. But when we rethink patience, we don't have to see it anymore as passive resignation, mere uh, hoping that things are going to get better, but as a hopeful anticipation of what God is and will be doing in our lives, that patience is actually an invitation to work, to witness, to worship. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the great kindness that you have shown us in the gospel. That you have been abundantly patient with us and have now as followers of Jesus, we have been empowered to be patient in whatever circumstance and whatever relationship we have. And so I ask that uh, as we leave this place today, you would continue to preach to us long after by your Holy Spirit to show us, cultivate within us uh, a deeper sense, deeper desire to be patient. Or would you produce patience in us? We thank you and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name, amen.